Okay, we have arrived at one of my all-time favorite crystal structures. It's in the ABX3. Examples are things like barium titanate, right? ABX3. Or strontium zirconate, or lanthanum aluminate. These are all uh, examples that can exist in this type of family, right? Because you have two different cations, these can have two different cation coordination numbers. The A cation has a coordination number of 12 whereas the B cation has a coordination number of 6. So here's the crystal structure, and we can see it. Can you tell where the B cation is? Right here in the middle. This black atom is clearly surrounded by 6 of these white atoms, right? So that must be the B cation. The B is going to be in the center. It's where the smaller cation goes, right? So of these ones, lanthanum aluminate, it's where the aluminum ion is going to go. Right? Now the bigger cation is the A cation. That's going to sit here on the corners. So that's our A, this is our oxygen, and then this one right there is our B. The A cation, it may not look like it, but it is 12 coordinate. Consider this one over here. This A cation is surrounded by one, two, three oxygen ions. Right? Those are each located on the center of the face, and it being on the corner, it's equally close to all of those. But remember, there are eight unit cells that that thing is shared with, and so eight times three sounds like 24, but remember, each of these oxygen atoms right here is halfway in and out of each of those unit cells, so it's actually 24 divided by two. That's where you get the coordination number of 12 for perovskite. Let's take a look at this crystal structure in Vesta. Here's the structure. You've got the really big cations on the corners. You've got titanium here. Let's go ahead and insert the ionic radii so that these get sized correctly. Okay, now we've inserted it to be ionic radii, and you can see that the oxygens are massive, like they ought to be, and the titanium is small. Now let's add our bonds. We come over here, and the first bond that we're going to add is titanium bonded to oxygen. Let's make the maximum length that we're going to search three, and sure enough, we get our first polyhedra. That's the titania polyhedra, titanium oxygen bonds. Now we could also look at the bonding between the A cation and the oxygens. Strontium bonded to oxygen. It's going to be messy, but we can go ahead and look at it quickly. It forms these dodecahedral units where there are 12 nearest neighbors centered around the oxygen, around the strontium. Let's get rid of that because it's a little bit messy. So now that we've got the perovskite crystal structure, you can see that it can be made up of these polyhedra that are connected via corners with other unit cells. Sure enough, you see, you have these corner shared polyhedra for the B cations, and then you have A cations sitting in the junctions between them. Another thing we can do is we can calculate the lattice parameter in terms of two different bonds. One, we could go between the oxygen and the B atom in the center, right? That would be half of the unit cell going from the top of this to the center of that. Or we could look along this face. Along the face, we could say, all right, from this atom, this green atom in the corner, to this center one, that should be half of the face diagonal. So let's go ahead and calculate both of those. On one hand, we have this distance. That's half of a unit cell. So 1 half times A should be equal to the radius of the oxygen plus the radius of the B cation. On the other hand, you've got this distance right there. And that should be square root of 2 times A divided by 2 should be equal to the radius of oxygen plus the radius of your A cation. Well, if you went ahead and plugged in these values for the radius of your oxygen and the radius of your B cation and the radius of your A cation, and you solved for A, the lattice parameter, if it was the exact same by solving it these two ways, then you would have what's called an ideal perovskite. Right? That means that these atoms fit together perfectly. They're all just so in the different directions. But in the real world, we don't always end up with ideal perovskites. We can end up with non-ideal perovskites, right? In fact, there's a way to calculate it. You're basically taking the ratio of these two lattice parameters right here. You're taking T, the tolerance factor, is equal to radius of the cation, the A cation, plus the radius of oxygen, divided by square root of 2, multiplied by the quantity of the radius of the B cation plus the oxygen anion. Again, if t equals 1, then it's an ideal perovskite, like we described here. If it's not, then it's going to be distorted. Why will it be distorted? The reason that these things distort is because atoms don't want to be in a cage that's too large for them. Consider this scenario. Here we have our corner shared polyhedra. Now, remember, the green atom, if it was shown to size, 
it would be basically filling up those gaps between there. What you don't want to end up with is a really large cage that's too large for that A cation. If it's too large, what you'll see happen is these polyhedra will tilt themselves. They will tilt. Instead of being lined up perfectly, they're going to tilt in order to decrease the size of that cage so that this, adion, this cation doesn't have too much room to rattle around in that cage and thereby stabilizes the system.